views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Time Warner Cable. Welcome to The Bottom Line. My name is Dana Connors and I am pleased to be the host of this monthly program brought to you by the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. As you have become familiar with the program, you know that each month we take a look at some of the issues, ideas and initiatives at work in our state to grow our economy and to improve the lives of Maine people. Today, I welcome two very special guests as we take a look at the next session of the legislature, the second session of the 127th. To do that, let me welcome two of our top leaders. They are our top leaders, the President of the Senate, Mike Thibodeau, and the Speaker of the House, Mark Eves. Welcome, guys. Uh, it's a real honor to have you on the show. I want to set it up very quickly by simply saying we have all come to know that the second session we consider the short session because instead of the middle of June, it's the middle of April. We also know that instead of 2,000 bills, you're probably dealing with more like 200 bills. You carefully distinguish it as kind of the emergency session. We deal with budget issues, some carryover bills, and some new bills that you guard pretty carefully to be sure that they are the emergency type. With that as a very simplistic background, I'm anxious to hear from your point of view how you see this session unfolding. What are some of your issues, some of your priorities, your party, your own? I throw it up to you, take it. Sure, Dana, I mean, uh, we're still gonna talk a lot about uh, the cost of energy in our state. I mean, we're seeing a little bit of a reprieve right now with the price of oil right. drop back, but the reality is that we've, we need to do some stuff uh, surrounding energy costs because that's important to our businesses. That's, that's what's going to drive Maine's economy both in the short term and the long term. So we've got some bills. Uh, I have a bill uh, that's before the Energy Committee. I, I think that uh, I'm in hopes that we can get some uh, support to get that passed. Um, incredibly important. Make no mistake, we continue to talk a lot about the drug issue, the drug e epidemic that's facing our state. Um, it is affecting not only people's lives personally, but it's affecting businesses both large and small. We've got to do what we can to uh, find solutions to that. I don't think that government has all the solutions, but I think we need to be part of the success of, of pushing back on, on this rampant drug crisis. And I would say whatever we do, and I do have high hopes, even though it is a short session, um, that we are creating opportunities for families in the state, uh, whether it is um, job creation initiatives uh, that we're partnering with businesses on, like we did this past session, whether it's making sure that seniors live in their homes and communities independently, whether it is addressing the energy issues in our state or the drug crisis, uh, making sure that we protect the gains that we made last session as well, whether it's putting more money in our kids' classrooms so we give them a better shot, uh, developing workforce training programs that we were successful in, went around the state, toured uh, the entire state, partnered with businesses. This public-private partnership, I believe what, what Mike does about government doesn't have all the answers and all the solutions, but we are part of that. And I think the best part of government is the convening power and the partnership power that we have, uh, whether it is addressing the workforce issues, energy issues, um, whatever we're gonna accomplish this session. I hope some of those are in, in, in our accomplishments when we do adjourn in April and we can reflect back on two years of being in the session, in, in, in the legislature, um, and in a political environment where people thought nothing would get done and that there would be stalemate, that we actually found a, a way forward and a number of significant issues for, for Maine families. Well, we did, and uh, at some point before I close out this section, I segment, I wanna be sure that I reflect on that because in large part is because of the partnership that the two of you in your leadership positions were able to cultivate and make happen that attributed to a large degree of the success that you both have spoken to. So at some point I want to be sure that I repeat that because it's very, very meaningful to us in the business community. Let me pick up on a couple of issues. As you said, it is a shorter session, but no less significant in terms of the critical types of issues that will help our economy or our people. Broadband is one that's a carryover. It's very fundamental, much like the transportation system and allowing us to compete 
and to be competitive. What do you see happening in that? I mean, there is teed up to be, I think, what's going to happen in the next three years in terms of access as well as speed for broadband. Is that your hope that that will is Absolutely. Will come I think uh, broadband is one of those areas, just, just like some of the areas that we were able to find this last session, yeah. to really um, wrap our arms around and do something for the entire state. It is more challenging in the rural areas, but just because it's challenging doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Right. We should certainly do it. And I think that this is one of those uh, areas that that it is teed up, yep. that there is agreement across the political spectrum that we have to do more. Uh, it's critical for our businesses to survive in a 21st century economy, and it's something that our families rely on. So I think I, I do have high hopes for that topic. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and I, I re met recently with the, the folks from Fairpoint about this very issue, and the, the reality is that the federal government is is focusing on, on broadband. They want to make sure that uh, that high-speed internet is available to as many people as possible and that they're going to be making some significant investments in our state um, through our, our different uh, broadband providers. Um, we ought to be pleased with that. But it is a very, very large issue, Dana, as you know. It is. Um, you know, just the whole telecommunications um, industry and the fact that they do have significant um, competition, um, that, that business model has changed dramatically. Um, it's just the reality that our urban areas subsidize our more rural areas. That was how telecommunications worked. And uh, now they have so much competition in our urban areas that, that they're feeling the pinch, the squeeze. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so it's, it's complicated, but, oh, it, but an important issue for our oh, state very to get its hands around. It's confusing to a lot of us. I put myself in that category. Um, but it's necessity is not in question. It's, you know, what, what do we need in order to compete and be competitive? Right. And I think that I commend you for that because I think it is an issue that needs to be well thought out and, and better understood by all of us. Let me just very quickly kind of a, uh, Lands for Maine's Future, the, the bond is still, we got part of it was released this week as a matter of fact, but there's still more pent up and I suspect there will be legislation to try to come to grips with the challenges surrounding freeing that up um, do you see other bond issues coming? Like, and what, re what reminds me of that is that last session and talking recently with the Commissioner of Transportation, there was kind of an expectation, I think it's fair to say, they anticipated another bond issue being brought forward as a companion piece to that. Is that in the thinking of the legislature for this short session, or is it too early to say? Well, obviously, uh, you know, I think that uh, things can change, but I, I anticipate that we're going to have another discussion, yep. particularly around the transportation bond. Yep. Um, you know, our infrastructure is in desperate need of, of attention, and, uh, you know, you don't have to drive too far in our state to, to see the need. Right. So I, and it's such an important part of, mm -hmm. of Maine's economy. I mean, if we don't have a good transportation network, then, then we're in trouble. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mark and I recently toured a bunch of mill sites and, and part of the, the discussion that we heard over and over and over again, every mill we went to, they talked about the railroad system and, and the need for um, that to work and work well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's, a, there's lots of opportunity for, for us to, to um, work together to, to really strengthen our infrastructure. Yeah, I think certainly it is going to be a conversation that we have. Hopefully we can, <coughs> again, invest in our infrastructure in the way that I think the people of Maine have have indicated that they want to every, yeah, time, every time the bond goes to the ballot. It yeah. is overwhelmingly yeah. supported. Um, as it relates to your, your commentary on the land for Maine's future, bonds and the, yeah. you know, the debacle that's been created there, it is good news that the governor um, has released half of it. But I would say proceed with caution. Uh, we've been there before where the governor said that those are going to be released and then, then they're not. Um, there are bills that are going to be coming forward uh, to address that. but. The reality is we shouldn't need a bill to address this issue. And hopefully, um, you know, this doesn't happen again. There are other bonds that passed, including the senior housing bond that passed, nearly 70% of the voters approved. Exactly. Hopefully that'll go through smoothly. So I just hope that that can be set aside, that we can, again, uh, have predictability for those contractors, developers, builders that are gonna be focused on the housing, that there's predictability for the land conservation piece and access to our public lands. Um, so I'm hoping that that issue is behind us, but I think we all need to be vigilant on the fact that, uh, that the governor has said that he'd release them before and then used it for another bargaining tool. Yeah. But clearly it is one of those programs that in a bipartisan way 
uh, people all across the state yep. support that program for a really good reason. Indeed they have and do. This next November, we have the possibility of seven initiatives being presented to the public for their approval or disapproval. Um, a number of them still await the sufficient number of signatures by the 1st of February, so that may pare some of them down. But at the same time, we're seeing a larger, larger number, it seems, of these initiatives being brought forward. And I don't question the right that people have to do it, but I confess, and I'd be interested in your reaction, it's a little troubling that, that this has become, hopefully this is an abnormality, but I worry that it may be a practice. Do you share that concern? Not that they have the right, but only that it takes the negotiating power away from the legislature and puts it into an up or down answer in which a lot of money is spent but you don't have the right to negotiate. Are you troubled by that? I think what we don't want to become is California right. uh, for a lot of reasons, but this is, <laughs> this is one of them. Um, they, they really do govern by, by initiative out there, and it's, it, I don't think it's the best um, process. I think that a lot of times the, 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 the well-funded campaigns win, um, and it's more about a campaign it than it is about the substance of a policy, and these are really significant issues that we're making decisions on. Um, I trust the people of Maine, uh, but I also think that they elect uh, leaders in, in a representative government to go do their job, and that's what we've been trying to do over the last, um, you know, elected, how, ma how many years, 10 years, uh, seven years, one, eight years. Uh, we do the best we can to represent our constituents, yeah. to pay attention to their, 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 what they want. So I, yeah. I do have a, a little bit of concern about yeah, that as well. That's my point, that. exactly. Yeah, and, and Dana, I, I think most people recognize that, uh, you know, California being the, the uh, example of it, uh, a lot of times, because of the initiatives they have out uh, in California, they find themselves at odds with, you know, yeah. with each other. I mean, they're, they're, they're not even in sync. And uh, so it's, it's a real uh, potential for a real mess. Yeah. And I, you know, I, so I do c have a little bit of concern. I don't want to say that I don't support the idea that, no, the, that the citizens yeah. should be able to weigh in, Dana, but it is a little troubling. We'll, we'll use the example of um, the Clean Elections Initiative. You know, uh, we're, we're now faced with going out and trying to find tax expenditures um, to fund clean elections. Tax expenditures um, uh, were described as loopholes. The fact of the matter is the business incentives. I think that's why the chamber came out in, in opposition to that. Um, you know, that's, that's a pretty high bar for us to go and end business incentives in this climate. Um, the legislature has looked at them business incentives a number of times trying to find money, trying to find, you know, something that wasn't working. Every one of them exists for a reason, and it's to encourage business, to encourage jobs in our state. And, and now we're faced with, you know, trying to go and, and, and you know, repeal some of them to pay for yeah. um, lawn signs. Uh, I guess that's what the people voted for, but I, I'm not sure that they fully understood right. what business incentives or, you know, what was described as tax loopholes really were. We're going to be uh, taking a break right now. Uh, my apologies to the guests that I had anticipated for the rest of the show because there are a lot of other things I want to explore, and we're going to do that right after these words from our sponsors. Thank you. Welcome back to The Bottom Line. My name is Dana Connors, and I am privileged to have two very special guests with me today. Speaker Mark Eves and President Mike Thibodeau. And as we left you, we were talking about the impact of not just the session, but the upcoming initiatives, which could be as many as seven that will be presented to voters. And some of the, not the right that people have, but some of the implications that come with, number one, the inability to, to make negotiations around the issues, adjustments that you'd like, if they're played out in the session. Um, one of the things, I want to go back to that for just a second, and then I want to follow up with, you both joined together to go around the state to listen to people, their priorities. I want to add just a snapshot of, of what you heard, their priorities. But first of all, let me give an example of one that really is an issue. It's a, it's a troubling issue for us with the Chamber, and that's minimum wage. Um, you have a minimum wage presented um, to the public in November, municipalities are starting to look at their own. This one calls for $12. 
in 2020, but it also asks to, to consider the tip wages as well as the cost of living adjustments annually. Well, here is one that as a chamber I can say that it's not so much the 750, but in this instance that's what you're left to debate. It's either 750 or it's 12 dollars with those provisions. And there's a perfect example of how it would have been nice if nice. It'd have been less problematic if we could have come to a solution. That's behind us now. But that presents for us, do you go after a competing measure? Do you oppose the the twelve dollars for twenty twenty? I'm not looking to you for an answer, uh, but just, I guess, a uh, word of an appreciation is yes. It kind of repeats where you were before, that it'd be nice if we could do that in the legislative session and not have this winner takes all or no advancement at all. Sure, and I, I think that, uh, you know, one community having a different wage than another community is going to prove to be very problematic. You know, uh, Bangor now is going to have a higher minimum wage than the folks in Brewer. Um, but the reality is, rather than, than trying to, to uh, set the minimum that we can pay people, we ought to be talking about ways to grow our economy yeah. so that we, you know, because yep. the effective minimum wage isn't, you know, what the minimum wage is. Um, most of, uh, if you go along the main coast in the summertime, you're lucky to find somebody to do a job for for $12 yeah, an hour. Exactly. So, you know, that's the good news, Dana. Yeah. We, we, we need to look for a solution um, at the legislature um, to uh, this, this ongoing debate, um, creating all these pockets, these inequity pockets is, is not good public policy for our state. Um, I think that's the, the exact wrong direction to go. So we'll, we'll be talking about that, working on that issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I'd agree with uh, President Thibodeau in terms of the statewide. We do need a statewide minimum wage. Um, and I, I think that's the value of the ballot initiative. The, the, some of what I hear you saying, Dana, is that, is that um, the right approach. And do we have an opportunity as a legislature to, to get that right? Um, right now, we are kind of in a bit of a bind exactly. about what yeah. Uh, what is the right direction, but I think we would all agree that the right direction is increasing workers' wages. The minimum wage is not good enough, but we also believe that if somebody works full-time, they shouldn't also have to rely on public assistance benefits that oh, are taxpayer yeah. dollars. I mean, we want to yeah. make sure that we're encouraging hard work, good wages, and that is why you know, we've gone all over the state talking to workers and businesses, and, and the things that we're hearing are, are many of the things that, that your members hear, and exactly. it's workforce. Yeah issues, it's energy issues, but overwhelmingly it has been workforce issues and that is something that I'm extremely proud of that we were able to be successful in, in this last session last year was establishing this put me to work program that is a public private partnership that works with industry, provides some public money, works with higher educational institutions and training institutions to really uh, make sure that we're filling those jobs that are available now and creating opportunities for people in high wage jobs. The logging industry is one area that we were able to focus on. Um, we were up in Millinocket several months ago with the ribbon cutting for that program. Students were there. We're providing opportunities for kids that live in rural parts of our state to stay here right where they want to stay. And it was really incredible to see them there and all the partnership that's happening. So I think that's the, the most yep. appropriate role for government and how we can really increase wages and, and, and not talk just about a minimum wage, but what is, you know, the opportunities for, for workers. But Dana, I don't think uh, you, we should close without saying, I mean, this $12 an hour minimum wage will create uh, some tremendous hardships for Maine small businesses. I believe that and, yep. uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant bump. Um, and is going to create some, some uh, you know, real hardships for small businesses that are trying to compete with our yeah. na other neighbors to the south. I read something interesting the other day, and I've got to be sure I'm sensitive to the time here, is that you can increase your minimum wage to about 60% of the median wage of your region without it having diminishing returns. Well, I think you'd find that the state, as I recall the numbers, a little over $16 an hour. But to your point, remind me of it, is the various regions of the state have a different median, and that's when you run into this inequity as well as the problem and challenge. You know, I, I don't want to, there's so much more I want to talk about, but I do not want to leave the show um, without expressing to both of you um, thanks for your leadership. I suspect you may be getting some criticism, uh, as some would characterize it, because you're holding hands with each other. 
um, and that's part of the enemy. But I gotta tell you, that's not the way we see it. I mean, we see it as a real statement of leadership, one that we look at with appreciation and applause. It's not lost on anyone. You, you, you have the privilege of the highest elected office in the legislature, the one that your teammates, so to speak, give you as an expression of faith in you. That's a wonderful position. But it's also true that you come from different places. I mean, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat. No harm in that. But when you look through the lens of whether it's politics, policy, or priorities, you're not in the same place. We know that. But that's what makes what you have accomplished so significant. You didn't in any way vacate your principles. You just worked together to get the job done. And I think when, when I reflect back on this last session, the acrimonious, the contention in the, in the, um, uh, in the Capitol, I'm struck by the extraordinary display of leadership. The fact that when you came together, you stayed together through some very troubling issues and times, and you worked together. That really set you apart and was an unusual display of leadership and we commend you for that. Conflict in the legislature, we all three of us know is very welcome because it's a way to get inside issues, to better understand them in its development, to ensure you understand the impact as well as the importance. But we also know too much conflict works the other way, particularly when it comes to politics or personalities. And too much focus on personalities comes at the loss of good policy in the same way that too much attention and focus on politics means we're fighting over who's right, not what's right. You guys stepped above that and set a wonderful example. We all say, whether it's the national level or state level, we want our legislature leadership to work together to get things done because we know it's the right thing to do. We also know that relationships matter. We also know that action speaks louder than words. Guys, your actions as leaders speaks volumes, volumes of your care and commitment for the state. That's why I wanted you on the show today as much as giving us a glimpse of the next session of the legislature. The state chamber and all of us members are very proud of what you do and the way you've been doing it. I want to thank the both of you. Thank you, Dana. Well, thank you, Dana. It's been a real pleasure and honor to, to work with President Thibodeau. Uh, it always, it has not been comfortable. I mean, I think to, to your point about how that's difficult, but it has been one of the highlights of my life so far, and thank you for taking the time to, to reflect on it. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, both Mac and myself um, have a commitment to passing good public policy. We don't always agree on what that is, yeah. but I think that the commitment is real on both our sides. You know, the 1.25 million people that are out living their lives, and they don't care about the all the personalities, they just care about, you know, whether or not we can pass some good public policy makes their lives just a little bit better. And uh, that's what I'm committed to do. I think that's what uh, Mark is committed to do as well. We see the world through a different set of lenses, but uh, both want to do the very best we can by our state. Well, and I think that's fully on display. I mean, everybody who knows the two of you know that you have tremendous respect for people and you're very, very sincere. And I think that standing up the way you have is a wonderful example and something that the majority of people in this state applaud and appreciate. Folks, that is our bottom line for this month. We appreciate our two leaders taking the time to share with us their insight, but also giving me an opportunity on behalf of our many members to say thank you. I also thank you, the viewing audience, for being with us again, but also for giving us suggestions on issues and ideas that you'd like to have us explore in the months ahead. We appreciate that. But most of all, the people of the State Chamber of Commerce and all of us members want to wish all of you a wonderful holiday season, a Merry Christmas, and we want to see you right back here in January. We hope above all else that you find the true meaning of this holiday season through the love of your family and friends. And with that, I say goodbye. Take care.